However, the state would argue that it does not have the authority to make the kinds of laws uh, that would challenge state law. Yes. And so, you know, but, we... But when you've got the municipalities the, saying that we're not going to hear from the people, how do you overcome yes. that? Um, depends. If we, we, it's worked um, various ways. We've had communities where, uh, in Pennsylvania, at the township level, uh, there are three township supervisors elected, and then they have the authority to uh, adopt ordinances. Uh, there is no initiative and referendum, and so the people can't simply put it on the ballot and make a law themselves. So they, they must approach those three individuals and prevail on them to adopt uh, the community rights law. In some cases, they simply flat out refuse. When that happens, uh, there is another avenue, and that is uh, to put a question on the ballot uh, to change the form of government and create a home rule charter uh, for the municipality. Mm -hmm. Now, that takes uh, that could take an hour, uh, a year and a half uh, for that to play out, play out, and so it's not the preferred quick fix, um, but it is actually um, a tool that we are using. Uh, creating a home, home community means um, electing a government study commission that then drafts a proposed home rule charter, which is like a local constitution. And in that charter, the communities that we're beginning to work with on those, uh, we're putting right into those charters the local bills of rights and the prohibitions on things like. Uh, um, now, if we don't go that avenue, uh, approaching the uh, elected officials often means persuading them and educating them. And often enough, they're not that well educated about what the issue is. And we also need, in a sense, separate them from the solicitor, from the law department, the, you know, the, the legal um, opinion uh, provider that they've hired. Uh, because what happens when they rely simply on the attorney for the municipality? They get legal advice that protects the interests of the municipal corporation itself, but in these types of cases, absolutely does not protect and fails to protect the rights and interests of the residents of the municipality. Yes. And so we try, we try to sharpen uh, the focus on this, um, you know, this dilemma for them to say you're in a bad position. The solicitor for the municipality has one responsibility and that is to provide you with the best legal advice to protect the interests of the municipal corporation which is a subdivision of the state so in that sense your state um, you're, you're simply local administers of, of state interests mm -hmm. um, on the other hand you took an oath of office to protect the health safety and welfare of community <clears throat> and if you only take the legal advice offered by this attorney, you will abandon your oath of office and fail to protect the health, safety, and welfare. Now, that puts these uh, these local officials, who are not paid very much for the service that they offer, uh, it puts them in a very difficult position. Some will say uh, and find justification to argue uh, that they can't violate the state laws, that they can't um, in any way challenge the state and I suppose they find a way to uh, sleep at night um, by not thinking about the health safety and welfare of the residents they shouldn't have been able to take the oath they, can't, I would, if they have a conscience I would, yes uh, and, and that may be uh, that is what we really tried to draw out and it's so it's about uh, uh, making uh, these elected officials aware of what the real situation is a matter of should we violate state law or not it's should we violate state law or should we violate our oath of office which one yes and That's so it's the, up to the community this is my conclusion too which is it's up to the community to say well we don't tolerate oath breakers amongst us certainly not claiming to be public servants that's that's exactly right uh, in some cases um, the the elected officials um, hear that message and make a difficult decision uh, to adopt the ordinance and, th and that we've had uh, uh, a number of cases of that just over the past two months yes um, it, in some cases uh, we've actually had um, communities force the resignation of 
members of the Board of Supervisors uh, prior, I mean, this is not at election time, I mean, uh, mid-term. Uh, we've, we've had them uh, insist on uh, the adopt of a, an ordinance, um, have uh, the supervisors adamantly refuse, and then the members of the community presented them with letters of resignation. Um, and they, they said something like, uh, because I um, find myself unable to live up to my oath of office, I hereby tender my resignation. Yeah. Uh, and we've, we've had uh, supervisors resign um, and been replaced and then had ordinances adopted following that as well. So there, there are, I mean, there are a number, and we'll continue to look for creative ways to uh, get to where we need. But in the end, uh, the question is, how can a community majority seeking a law to be adopted that protects fundamental rights, how can they be denied? Yes. And here's another question, which is, uh, are these these communities, have the majority actually voted to be represented by these municipalities? Um, have they have they actually uh, chosen the municipality itself? Yeah, they voted on a candidate and in that action consented to being represented by the municipality. Well, uh, in terms of um, elections and, and turnout and so forth, I would say that uh, it's usually a rather small percentage of voters, of eligible voters who uh, engage in local elections. And, you know, I used to be a cynic and, and think, well, I guess they get what they deserve then if they're not going to participate. Um, but frankly, and, and the same, by the way, with, um, you know, participation in uh, monthly uh, municipal meetings, the turnout is usually minuscule. Mm. And I used to be a cynic about that and say th these folks are um, they're just apathetic. Uh, but it's not, I don't believe, true. Um, my experience having worked with communities now for about seven years with this type of organizing, I, I've concluded that hard people don't go to meetings where they know that the outcome has already been decided and they can't have a, an effect on the outcome. Yes. And, and it also seems I'm to me I'm going to call you that, right back there. Yes. Yes, yeah, smart people don't uh, go to meetings where the outcome is predetermined or a process that they know is not going to give them empowerment. That's right, and, and really the same with the elections. We have um, you know, two major political parties uh, who work uh, in tandem to uh, exclude any third uh, party from being uh, gaining any serious power in this country. And the two parties um, choose their candidates um, a, as parties and then offer them to uh, the voters. The voters then have a choice between, you know, um, plastic and paper in terms of, you know, bags at the grocery store. Yes. Um, they, they really don't have many other choices. And for that, for them to stay home, um, you know, it may be that some people don't believe that uh, local government matters very much because it has very little power and authority, um, and you know increasingly so um, over the activities of corporations. Um, that may be uh, part of it, and I think the other part is that uh, people don't believe that uh, they participate at all in uh, the options that they're given a choice between. You know, choose A or B. Yes. Uh, well, it's interesting. Explore. Uh, dictionary has a uh, an interesting definition on um, on democracy, and it's there's either representative or uh, popular direct democracy, and one must ask what came first, and it's obvious that people were first making decisions directly, and chose to then create representative roles, and vote for those representative roles. So, from my opinion, when you when you don't vote for representation, it it must default back to your ability to decide by popular by popular vote directly. That that seems to make sense. And uh, you know the other piece is that what we call representative democracy uh, in, in the U.S. Partly and, and in other countries, there are lots of forms of it. Um, I would argue that there is no 
democracy at all in the United States, not direct nor uh, representative. Um, even if, well, let's just let's just uh, imagine the best representative government, where uh, the people of a certain area elect one person to speak for them because for them because it would be unwieldy, say, to have a thousand people go to a meeting and, and all get to vote. And so you elect one person to represent the thousand. Well, if the one person um, regularly uh, makes decisions and votes uh, on issues put before the legislative body that favor, say, corporate interests and regularly dismiss the thousand people back home, um, then there is not democracy of any sort and there is no representation. Yes. We, what we what we simply have is some bizarre form of um, of selecting corporate uh, representatives. Corporate heads. And, and, yeah. Yeah. And, and in Pennsylvania, um, where I live, uh, it's it's even stranger that each of the municipalities uh, we have in Pennsylvania sixty seven counties, and we have. Um, I guess about 1,200 second-class townships, and altogether about 2,000 municipalities, including cities, boroughs, townships. Yes. <clears throat> you know, in the state legislature, there is no representation for municipalities. The the um, people elected to the state house are elected by um, electoral districts, and those districts districts are carved up by population. And the, what are the boundaries of those districts? They're chosen by whichever of the two major political parties is in office at the time of redistricting. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, they're gerrymandered. Uh, in, totally. In other words, so so what, what we have is um, represent, representative districts drawn regardless of municipal boundaries. And so when we we talk about local governments not uh, being empowered to uh, govern themselves and to be captains of their own fate, um, even on a representational level, they have no, absolutely zero representation in the state government as municipalities. None. Well, this is a very interesting point because historically, the way that uh, territories were were landmarked was by geographic feature. Have you actually had communities? group together and say, you know, from this river here to here to here, to actually draw their own zone, so to speak, for, for making a decision? Well, we have, um, uh, as a matter of fact, that may, uh, you know, that would uh, certainly be something something uh, in the future when we talk about uh, creating a people's constitutional convention to rewrite the state constitution, um, I would think there should be uh, attention paid. Um, to how uh, communities are defined, how municipalities, if you will, are defined, local governments, and and also uh, to pay attention that they are each represented um, as communities in their, their own right. Um, if we're going to have a state legislature, and I say if because the I don't want to presume anything about how people might write a new constitution, uh, yes. but in terms of uh, uh, you know whether ge geological and geographic um, aspects should that play in. Uh, I would think surely, uh, but to do so right now to attempt that uh, would really, I think, just be a symbolic effort. Uh, there would be no uh, recognized authority of uh, a newly drawn uh, map of that sort. There would, you know, at least at this point, the municipalities um, are recognized to have. Uh, lawmaking authority, whether or not they can make the kinds of laws we're drafting for them, uh, is where the question arises. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the big. I suppose the biggest question is how do the people get the pen back, so they can write a piece. You know, they can write the constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And and, and uh, you know, peacefully is is very important. And uh, there's nothing more peaceful uh, than participating in the governance of your community and writing laws that assert rights and uh, and and denying the authority of laws that violate rights. Yes, I agree, and thanks for making that point. That's great. Now, once a, a local law is passed, let's say it's even um, 
yeah, okay, it's it's a, it's passed by and recognised in the local municipality. What uh, what do you think of citizens or local local people using uh, common law such as abating and abating a nuisance? You know, if someone came in and was about to break that law, their right to actually directly abate it. What do you think of that? Uh, you mean for the the citizen to take action? Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure. I guess it would de- depend on the the situation. But yes, I think that uh, people do have rights uh, and to uh, abate nuisances. Um, sometimes nuisances are even more than nuisances. Yes. Uh, you know, if if you're burning old tires in in your uh, the back in a, behind your house. Uh, that may be a nuisance, but it also may be a health hazard, and it may be a, a lot of other things. Yes, public nuisance, so definitely. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, if you're dumping toxins into the stream that uh, runs down downstream to where they drink the water, uh, that's not just a nuisance. Uh, that's a criminal act. Yeah. Yeah, and everyone's and, empowered to uphold the law and prevent breaches of the peace. That's right. Yeah, this is the big the big challenge that we're facing in New Zealand, and I'm sure it's internationally too, which is through this uh, the, the media regurgitating the state and government legislature. People don't know their inalienable rights, and that, and it feels like it sounds like such a radical, strange concept for them to actually do some, them to actually do something in their own interests or in the public interest. Yeah. Uh- Sure, and and you know, in theory, the idea uh, has been well. Let's not have uh, vigilante justice. Let's not have uh, people out deciding for themselves uh, what's legal, what's not, and what the punishment should be, and uh, you know, rule of law and so forth. But um, yeah, and I, and I think that that's not a bad rule of rule to go by. But it's um, dependent you know, upon an independent um, judiciary. Well, and expedient. There is, there is yes. no such thing. Apparently. Exactly. So when there is no independent, independent judiciary, I mean, in New Zealand we've got courts just uh, blocking private prosecutions now, not even hearing them. Yes. Well, that that certainly is uh, um, a denial of justice, and uh, justice denied by government uh, uh, illegitimizes government. Yes. Yeah. So we've we've got some major issues down in New Zealand. Just to give you a little reason why I'm I'm so grateful that and the work that you guys are doing and and uh, and your willingness to share that information. That information, we've got um, basically a foreign corporate takeover, which is uh, stock market driven, U.S. stock market driven, um, where the government's signing off plans, wholesale plans to foreign foreign corporations. And using our uh, military to um, protect those plans against the, the the desires of the local populaces. Uh, so we've got uh, we've got some major issues with mining and uh, offshore uh, oil exploration, gas exploration, our iron sands in New Zealand, uh, minerals, um, GE genetic engineering food that's that the government's trying to introduce even after a huge majority of the population has said no. So what would your message be to, to our communities right now? When the national government will not act in your interests, then you must act in your, at the local level. Uh, we have communities that are working on ordinances to uh, ban genetically engineered um, organisms and crops. Um, We have communities that have uh, outlawed the extraction of water for bottling and export. Um, You you know, there are a lot of issues. It's the office, um, really just the symptom of the big disease. And the the, really the disease we need to cure is the denial of the right to self-determination. And that means use your local governments, use your cities, use your counties, use your whatever the, the local form is. And the, the tools vary. Um, but don't let 
yourself be stopped by the assertion that, well, you can't do that here. We don't have that authority. Mm -hmm. um, authority. You don't need to ask permission for your rights, nor do you need to ask permission to assert them. And if the national government uh, makes a deal with the devil uh, against the consent of uh, the people, um, the people need to rectify the situation. Uh, the government is no longer the people at this point. It is the corporations. Um, and that is, that is what you're up against. Yes. And as you said, it's it's this the disease in the mind that we don't you know how do we get through to people that they have these rights I and mean, what's the most effective tool that you've found for that? It's you know you point out something that, that um, is really central to this. I I can uh, go into any given community and say I know you're up against what look like huge hurdles, rights, state preemptions. Uh, a regulatory fallacy that makes it look like you have a, a, a solution available, but you don't. But of all of the obstacles that you face, the biggest one is the doubt in your own mind that you have the right to do this, to stand up and get the outcomes you want, regardless of what the, the government have the competency, that you have the authority. And, you know, these are the things that if you can overcome the doubt in your own mind, the rest of the actually become a lot smaller. Yes. Um, the biggest one, the biggest one is uh, is the one between our own ears, and that's what we have to overcome. How do you do that? Um, well, it, for different people, there are different, uh, perhaps different paths, but um, <clears throat> it's very clear to me that the most victimized among us uh, are the most clear about what the, when we're very comfortable, uh, when it might mean inconveniencing ourselves and giving up, uh, you know, our automobile or our television or you know some luxury. Um, people who have luxury and have surplus of things um, generally will allow the their rights to be um, stripped away uh, blindly because uh, those comforts seem to. The, the privileges, of, the privileges of the status quo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they seem to they seem to uh, insulate us from uh, the real world of what's happening to our rights. Um, so it's it's maybe the rare person um, who is privileged who is going to uh, be able to stand up uh, and be counted. Um, but as things get tougher, yes. and they do, uh, and realize that. Um, something else is going on. It's not simply an inconvenience to be without your rights. Yes. Yeah, the rights are essential <laughs> to a Absolutely. good life. Now, Absolutely. how are you guys funded, Ben? <clears throat> um, we are a non-profit public service law firm. That's the, the, the de general definition of what we are. Um, and we do not take uh, money from the government or corporations. We um, we file for uh, grants, you know, we approach uh, foundations and individual donors, and so it's about split half and half between, um, you know, the, the grants that we receive and the individual donations. Oh, great, great. And how can people find you? Our website is CELDF.org, stands for Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, CELDF.org. And all of our contact information is there. Great. Thank you very much for your time today and, and even more so for, uh, for the work that you guys are doing. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Simon. It was great talking with you.